to have a special guest uh, display some dinosaurs for us in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but we'll wait for him to come back. A <laughs> uh, couple quick uh, reminders. Uh, we do not meet for a couple of weeks because I'm going to be gone. So September 1st, I think, is the first Thursday in September, and that's when we'll probably meet again. And we're pretty well wrapping up dinosaurs in the Bible. So probably today might be our last time, and then we'll but be thinking <coughs> about what's the next thing you want us to study. And you, we have a lot of options because that can be a chapter of the Bible, a book of the Bible, a topic like dinosaurs in the Bible. That wasn't, you know, we were looking wherever it was found, Job and Psalms and, you know, Isaiah. Um, but so if there's something that really intrigues you that you've been thinking of that you want us to study, well, I'm wide open. I can always come up with ideas, but I'd rather do what you want than my ideas. So just uh, I'll give you the little time to think about that. And... Um, so I'm going to be gone for two Sundays, and, uh, but we have a special guest preacher coming this Sunday because Corey's coming back. Um, yeah, so he's going to be preaching uh, on Sunday, Corey Brooks, so we're excited about that. He was coming back for uh, Morgan Lane's uh, ordination and installation at Bethel, um, and so uh, we got it worked out where as long as he's going to be here on a Sunday, we might as well let him preach here. So we're excited about that. I'll be watching online. Well, probably not live, but <laughs> you know, that's a little early on California time there. Um, and just a reminder, if you haven't got a hummingbird feeder yet, there's some in the, in, in the parish hall. Um, Uncle Bear is, uh, is, I forget, he's somewhere in his 80s. I don't know exactly how old. But that's one of his hobbies is making hummingbird feeders. And he knew uh, I he listens on the radio. He calls a lot of mornings before six o'clock in the morning. He's an early riser, and uh, he. But he, he knew I had vacation Bible school coming up, so he said, "I'm going to get you some hummingbird feeders. I need you to give them away." And he brought like 75. So I mean, he, <laughs> so we, I've probably given away half of them. So I need help here. So don't hesitate to take some. All right. Uh, any other announcements before we get started? All right, this is going to be a review, but uh, since uh, we didn't meet last week, look, turn to Job 40, Job chapter 40, and if you're looking for Job, it's just before the book of Psalms. So the book of Psalms is in the middle of your Bible, and then uh, Job's the last book before the book of Psalms. So Job 40, and we're just going to review the Behemoth. So this Job 40, starting at verse 15. Yeah, from, um, look at the Behemoth, which I made along with you. And notice God saying, you know, here's, I made you, I'm the creator, but here's another one of my works. In which feeds on grass like an ox. There's good news, because as big as they are, we want them to feed on grass. Um, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze, and they have to be to support his weight. Um, his limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with the sword. And it kind of goes on. So even the behemoth is not a problem for God to handle. The largest of the land animals, God's got it covered. And then in chapter 41 is the Leviathan, and that's the largest of the sea animals. And again, God's, you know, no one else can, can uh, control a Leviathan, but God can. And all this is to show God's power and strength. You know, this is, this is who God is. And this is in response to Job's question, um, how come, God? It doesn't seem fair. You know, I lost everything. I didn't, I'm, the, I'm better than a lot of people. You know, I'm, you know. Um, and I don't understand God. And God doesn't answer the why question. He just says, who are you to question me? 
You know, can you do the things I do? And he kind of, yeah, yeah, it's not the answer we want. We want God to explain everything in great detail. Here's why. How often do you think I get asked the why question by someone? Why is God allowing this to happen? Every day. Yeah, pretty much. Maybe not quite that, but every week for sure. And I can't answer the why question. I mean, I have some general principles that may or may not apply, you know. Um, we know he's working everything for good, and, you know, so he, he uses it for the good of his kingdom, maybe to give you an opportunity to spread the gospel, or maybe it's to uh, help you grow in your faith and in the, your character. You know, you can say some of these general things, but I can't answer why, because God doesn't answer why. He just says, trust me. But I just wanted to give an example. And, and here, and, or if you saw online, the, uh, B, this would be a Brachiosaurus. Uh, the one thing I disagree with this picture of, if you look at the behemoth, his tail is, this, it's hard to see the perspective, but I don't think, I think his tail's bigger than this that it shows. Because it, it's like a cedar tree. And maybe here it is, but I don't think it gets that small that quick. I think it stays a little bigger. And, and just imagine, if he swings his tail back and forth, how big of an arc of a circle he can... Wipe out an army. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, because this is like a cedar tree. I mean, that's what we just read. So when that comes swinging, and, and you think of how strong he has to be just to support his own weight. <coughs> You know, ooh, it'd be interesting. All right, who's really good on your smartphone? Somebody look up how much a bro Abby, <laughs> you, you have an assignment. Look up how much a brachiosaurus weighs. Because it's in the tons, you know, I know that, but I have no idea. Yeah. Do we keep... Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. As much as 99,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds. <laughs> so that's 50 ton by my recollection. That's a big animal. <laughs> yes. In here it says it's possibly an elephant. Yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> In that part where it says his tail sways like a cedar, down here it's got possibly trunk, like an <laughs> elephant trunk. Um, yeah, see, and these are people who have bought into part of evolution and don't think dinosaurs existed at the same times as people. So then they can't use a dinosaur. You know, we, we know evolution's false, so then we have no problem with saying, yeah, this is a dinosaur, obviously. It doesn't even make sense. And, and if God's saying it, God's not gonna describe a tail for a trunk, you know. God knows he made it, you know, so yeah. Yes, <laughs> but he doesn't get things wrong, you know, so yeah. So I just wanted to show that. All right, now let's talk about the ark again just a little bit, and then, we'll, yeah, then we'll look at things. If you read on 41 about the Levi, the Levi yes. then it says in verse 15, his back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. Yes, and you, you went on further than, yeah, his back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Now, that's why you can't harpoon him. What's the one that has the big thin-looking uh, thing? That Stegosaurus, I think, had the plates. Now, that's a land animal, so this is Leviathan. Yeah, but here, it's like shields right on top of his back so that if you go to harpoon it, it's like he has armor on the, you know, and nothing's going to penetrate between them. They're so tight together. And in fantasy movies and stuff, that's what a dragon looks like. Yes, exactly so. They, what, what does a dragon look like? Yeah. Um, which is, I, I've always been frustrated that everything with um, what we call dragons has been put as mythical. In, instead of tying that in with Dinosaurs, because we find fossils of dinosaurs, and you know what? A lot of the dinosaurs look a lot like what we would say dragons look like. And whether that's a pterodactyl, which would be a flying, you know, and there's a whole bunch of other dinosaurs that fly. I don't know what they are, um, but or you know, with some of the land ones, they still all kind of have that 
you know, that's, they have one term they call dragons. That's every, all dinosaurs were called dragons. You know, that's, that's what we see. But, you know, because we are so sophisticated and we have our model and anything that doesn't fit the model, we have to, yeah, we have to get rid of it. So, you know, dragons had to be mythical because we can't have dinosaurs living at the same time as people. Because they're millions of years apart. Yes, uh, you know, millions of years apart. Hundreds of millions in, of the earliest dinosaurs. So. Explain why when they're carbon dating. Well, carbon dating, and this is a, it's a much, very complicated argument, so I'm just going to give you the short part. 30,000 views. <laughs> yeah, because so... I've read them, I don't fully understand, but there are um, biologists and, 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 uh, and physicists who, are, who have written vast articles, The Problem with Carbon Dating. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Mount St. Helens uh, exploded, I think at the end of the 70s or early 80s. You remember Mount St. Helens in Washington? I came into uh, uh, Montana, Western Montana in 1985. Yeah, I had to think. And um, Mount St. Helens, when it blew, uh, they were describing the whole valley was filled with ashes. You could not drive your car because it would clog the filters and you'd, your engine would overheat. I mean, you didn't drive in it. You just parked it and stayed wherever you were because otherwise it was, you were in great danger. But um, so they took um, some stuff that came out of Mount St. Helens and carbon dated it. Now, how, what should it have been? Like 10 years it's old, old. <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, and it came back as millions of years old. Well, that's impossible. We know when Mount St. Helens has exploded. This is, you know, the volcanic stuff that comes out, the lava, the, what are, magma, magna? No. Yeah, I, I, can, I don't know. Yeah. I did a lot of reading on it at one point. The easiest way I can I try to explain it to people is when they were you coming up with this and they were doing it, but they, I think the oldest thing they knew they tested against was a tree yeah. that they could count the rings on. So it went back, I think that was 3,000 years is what they had decided that that tree was. But anything beyond that, to me, it's no, no different than having a thermometer, and then there's only numbers in the middle of that thermometer. Once it gets beyond that range where you know what 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 it is you're making an educated guess at it. yeah in in the, here's the real problem so it's based on like uh, carbon dating there's a radioactive form of carbon and I don't won't tell you which one it is carbon 14 or something like that and um, and what they assume is that it's always breaking, you know, it's half-life is this, and so we can, you know, we can, we think everything's constant. And it's based on uniformism. That everything has always been the way it is now. Now, that's not true. So when did all conditions on Earth change? At the time of the flood. The, what was the conditions of the earth before the flood is totally different. And I will tell you, a lot of the carbon dating type stuff is very accurate to about five, 6,000 years ago. And, but when you try to go before the flood, it doesn't work at all. And, and so then they come up with all these ridiculous things. Um, but, and I, I did not explain the technical parts at all because that's, you know, maybe when my younger years I would have understood it more, but I don't anymore. But uh, yeah. Well, I if God made Adam as a man, he could have made that sample of rock ever what age he wanted that rock to be. <laughs> yeah, and, and just think, so the condition of the earth, um, how many continents were there before the flood? One, right, and, and by the way, our geologists would agree with that, that there was, you know, uh, now they can't explain what happened that the one got all, you know, became. We can. It's when, right, and yeah, when the flood started, we're going to be looking at this, the water starts coming up from the deep, and the whole earth is torn apart, and everything is covered with water. The water rises and covers, and then it goes back down, and when it comes back down, we got all these continents. Everything's different. Mountain ranges have been formed, you know, uh, trenches made in the deepest part of the ocean. Every, everything's different. And you cannot date things before the flood 
using the same process that you did. Well, I, this is speculation, I can't prove it, but I don't think it ever rained until the flood. So environment totally different. Um, how old did people live before the flood? 900 plus in some cases. Uh, how big did animals get? <laughs> you know, everything was different. It's ideal growth. You know, um, there was a thick canopy. So if you don't think of the greenhouse effect, this was perfect. You know, and there wasn't the harmful effects of the sun, there in plus a perfect gene pool, but everything is different after the flood. So the uniformism is the real problem with carbon dating. It always assumes that the, the same exact processes that happen now happened before the flood. And that's the weakness of it. Plus, in a practical terms, it's imprecise. It doesn't always give the same results. It gives ridiculous results some of the time. And if it's not consistent, why are we relying on it? Why do we say it's so good, you know? So, all right. But, um, so I just wanted to start there. So then go to Genesis 7. Uh, yeah, Genesis 7. This is the fun part. And so I'm going to tell you, Genesis 7 does not uh, describe dinosaurs in detail, but dinosaurs are in everything that's going to happen with the flood, the ark. All of that is part of the, the story. So I'm just going to start at verse 1 and... We're, we're just kind of given an overview, but what I want to do is establish a Christian worldview in light of the flood. If we, if we understand the ark and the flood, then what happened with dinosaurs, the fossils that exist, um, why did they die out, all that stuff makes sense if you have that biblical worldview. Um, what is the current theory in non-Christian sources for what happened to all the dinosaurs? So Mr. T. Rex. You know, other than the one we've got right here, you know, they're all pretty well died out now. Except on one island in the Caribbean, and, uh, yeah. yeah. I saw a movie about that today again, too, and it's not looking good for us, by the way. Uh, they evolved into other animals. So yeah, so, and that's part of what they say. You know, chickens are a form of a dinosaur. <laughs> I really have trouble with that. <laughs> a meteor. Yeah, yeah. yeah and what they say is a meteor came and a huge meteor, all kinds of dust, and it caused global cooling, I guess. The dust would have reflected the sunlight, so temperatures fell off. Um, I would say there's a partial, that may be a partial explanation, but it doesn't explain most of why are there so many fossils then. So let's say a T-Rex uh, gets in a fight with another T-Rex and um, one of them dies, you know, there's one of them's gonna win. And so he falls over on the ground and um, what happens to him? Well, one, there's gonna be other dinosaurs that come and eat his meat, you know, so most of the flesh is gonna be consumed. Uh, what happens to his bones and I don't know what else he's got in there, but. They're, they're going to lay there, but they're microorganisms, as long as they can get oxygen, that will bit by bit over time, and we're talking years, not minutes, um, they'll, they'll consume the bones. I mean, so if, you know, if a, a bird hits your window and falls down and you don't do anything, well, in a year or two, there won't be bones left there. They'll, they'll be gone, you know. And yeah, now that's it. And, and so that's part of what we're going to talk about is what kind of conditions you need to form fossils. And then you think in Montana or the La Brea area in California where you get hundreds and hundreds of Colorado, you know, um, there's all these places where they get hundreds of dinosaur fossils of all different types, you know, and they have fun piercing them all together because it's like there's just this huge stack of them. You know, all mixed up, and some of them, it's pretty easy to figure out which parts go to which, and some they don't do so good at. But, you know, why is that? Well, flood explains it all. So, all right, so go to, go to Genesis 7, verse 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I found you righteous in this generation. Now notice, that's a pretty cool statement. So was Noah and his family perfect? No. What made them righteous? Yeah, in fact, the Hebrews 11, when they talk about the 
hall, what I call faith hall of fame. It's by faith that we are declared righteous. Um, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, it's faith that makes us righteous. So what made the difference? No and his family walked with God. And you see that. God says, I need you to build this boat. Now, if you look at the dimensions of the ark and the tools they had at that time, um, this is a major thing, 100-year project. I'm just thinking I get discouraged if anything takes more than like a half hour. Uh, you know, I usually start and think, uh, I'll just get someone else to do it, you know. Well, there is no one else going to build that ark, but he labors along with his family for all those years, 120 years. Woo! I, I mean, that is, that's a guy who loves God. But he's not perfect. How do we know he wasn't perfect? He's human. One, he's human, so we already know what that means. And two, um, we see an example of sin in his life after the flood, you know. You know he, what does he do to celebrate the making it through? He gets drunk. You know, kind of embarrasses himself and his kids and, you know. Uh, but he's still God's guy, you know. But, all right, so I found you righteous in this generation. And by the way, that's it. You remember the negotiation that Abraham did with... Now, Lot was living in Sodom, right? Lot and his family. So there were a few righteous people. Um, and he, Abraham kept negotiating down because he really was trying to save Lot. But ultimately, when it came down to it, it was only Lot and his family. You know, and just like the flood. Yeah, I mean, every inclination of man's heart, it says in the, uh, this, um, describing the conditions of the time of the flood, was always evil all the time. Now, that's scary, always evil all the time. I kind of think we're seeing a return to that a lot lately. You know, when... Uh, even the most wonderful people think uh, having drag queens read to three and four year olds is a good thing, you know. And that's called grooming, by the way. You know, we're creating people. We're creating more LBQTR, whatever the, all the initials are. I saw the video of a drag queen in the church in New York. Yes. They celebrated it. She came, or he came, prancing down the aisle and had the whole church stood up and just was clapping it. It was a I Lutheran mean, church, too. The, the, <laughs> the one I saw. The skirt was way Not up Missouri above. Synod, in case you're wondering. The skirt was way up above, and I mean, it was... But, yeah. you know, when we talk about always evil all the time, um, the things that I think of are evil, the world calls good. The things I think are good, the world calls evil. You know, so... Mm, so we, we want to be the few, the faithful, you know... Um, to the fact, too, that his family was not interbreeding with the Nephilims and all that, that separated them from... Um, that wasn't the criti critical part, you know, in other words, because of faith, they were going to marry other believers, not unbelievers. You know what I'm saying? And by the way, those are not angelic beings who came down from heaven to have sex with humans. You know, that's, uh, that's the story that goes around that, uh, um, you know, who, who is that? That's someone outside of the faith. You know, that's, but there, there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes around that I get asked about, you know. Is, but the, the one I get asked about a lot is, and it's a popular theory with those um, kind of on the fringe of Christianity, that uh, uh, angels came down from heaven and had sex with men, and then that giants, you know, like the Goliath line was all a result of that. And it's like, uh, no, a angels don't have sex. Demons don't have sex. I mean, that's just, eh. So anyway, all right, keep going. Verse 2. Take, oh, is there, was there another question? I'm sorry. Take, take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Um, so, what is he doing? Why, two, we understand, male and female, they're going to be young, you know, because they're easier to control, smaller in size, you know, 
especially think dinosaurs. Um, but um, why seven of some? Yeah, they still had the sacrificial system. And so, you know, that, that wasn't being done away with at this point. Um, then verse 4, seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'll wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I've made. So anything not on the ark would be wiped away. Now, what kind of animals would not have to go on the ark? Fish would not have to. I got asked that question as a teenager when I was teaching Sunday school. Yes, well, in the... Nobody ever told me what happened to the fish. <laughs> yeah, and, and there are some that want to argue with us even about that. Well, because, uh, you know, we had a mixture back then, so water's all over the earth. Is it salt water or fresh, fresh water? Whatever it, they need. <laughs> yeah, now the answer is um, the oceans get a little saltier with each passing year. Why? Because of erosion. Um, so the water that evaporates is, doesn't take salt with it. Um, the water that comes in is uh, taking uh, erosion, is carrying minerals like salt into it. So it always is going to get saltier because um, e evaporation doesn't take rid of salt. So back then it wouldn't have been as salty as it is now. By the way, if you want to do the age of the earth and you go by how salty the water is, you'll come up with like less than 10,000 years, and they don't tell you that. You know, back when there would have been no salt in the water. But this is early on, so it would have been a little bit of salt. So could freshwater fish survive in that? Yeah. Yes. Could saltwater fish survive in that? Yes, I think so. You know, so, um, and if God wants them to, they would anyway. But I mean, I, I don't think that would be a problem. Um, but just know, oh, who else wouldn't have to be on that? So. So who else would not have to be on the ark? So fish, uh, whales, dolphins, that kind of stuff. Sea dinosaurs would not have to be on that. Yeah. So who, what else wouldn't have to be on the ark? I guess any sea creature. Yeah, any, anything that lives in the water, but also certain types of birds would not have to, right? Mm -hmm. Ducks. Ducks can float on the surface. They don't have to, you know, what, swans, geese, you know. Now, they may have been on the ark, I'm just, but, you know, it, things get a little more manageable when you start, you know, because everybody wants to say, oh, you couldn't fit all on. Well, he didn't have, how many varieties of dogs are there today? If you watch that dog show, what is that big one that's uh, once a year? Um, Westminster, yeah. Ooh, how many breeds of dogs do they have in there? I mean, it's just astronomical, and we keep coming up with more because we're kind of creating them. Well, there weren't that many breeds of dogs that got on, you know. Probably there were two, and within that genetic structure of those two dogs are the stuff that would later become, you know, what we call you know, because again, we believe in microevolution, evolution within species. We don't believe in macroevolution, evolution where animals become different animals, etc. All right. So, um, but there's the warning. Um, I'm going to wipe everything off. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. That is a powerful statement. I wish that statement could be made about me. And Scott did everything the Lord had commanded him. Done some, <laughs> but uh, a lot not. Hmm. But Noah did everything with the ark, everything with getting on board, everything about the ark he did. So Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. He was just, what, middle-aged, I guess we would say? <laughs> Still got some jump in his step. Yeah, go ahead. So right here it says, after he told him to get all the animals on there, he says seven days from now. So he gave him one week to get all those animals. Yeah, but Noah right. didn't have to get the animals on board. That's what I've heard. Yeah. So everything yeah. new to come. Be come yes, to yes. So, and you can think of some of the movies, like kids' movies they make about the flood or some of the paintings. They show the animals two by two marching into all on their own. And... I more or less, that's what I think happened. You know, God led them on because how in the world is Noah and, uh, and, a, and a few other people going to get two of every type of animal over all of that one huge continent? You know, th there's no way. 
but they didn't have to. They were responsible for building the ark, getting food on board, all the stuff God had told them to do, but, but that was it. Um, so uh, verse, yeah, when the floodwaters came on the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. So it started raining, and they knew what that meant. One, it was seven days after God said it, and I think it had never rained before, so when water starts coming down, they knew what that meant. Um, Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark. There you go. Because those who want to poopah the story are really failing to understand God's Almighty. He made all those animals. He can lead a pair of them in or seven of them in. Um, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the floodwaters came on the earth. Now, I just want you to think. So who shut the doors of the ark? It kind of does, and, but um, God did. Yeah. God did. Then the Lord shut him in. Yeah, the Lord shut him in. Yeah, we haven't got to that part yet. But um, what do you think all the people who had ridiculed Noah, what do you think they felt when the rain started coming? And, and at first, you know, they probably would have enjoyed it, you know. But then when there's puddles are getting ankle high and then knee high, what do you think they felt then? I think so, and then, you know. Before, that would cause panic right there to me. If it's never rained before and you've never felt that, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, and then you think of this guy who was building a boat in the middle of a desert um, that didn't make sense, but he kept saying, uh, flood's coming. You better get, you know, you, you need to be ready for it. I'd have been panicking when I saw all the animals coming. <laughs> yeah, that should have been enough. You know, yeah, you know, you see lines of, you know, two giraffes and two lions and two tigers. Yeah, that should have been enough to uh, get them. Huh, that's weird. Never seen that before. And then it starts raining. Huh, never saw that before. Huh, that guy who's building an ark that I never saw that before. Maybe he knows something, you know, but um, by they ran and tried to well, I, get on the And I like to spec this is all total speculation, so I'm just saying that. But I can imagine them, um, especially when the water gets up to their waist or something, and they're grabbing hold of a log that's floating or something, I can imagine them totally panicking. And maybe if the ark somewhere near them, hey Noah, can you can you get us on board? Now that didn't have any real way of for Noah to do that. That's why, yeah, the Lord shut him in. Yeah. Because then, you know, you're not getting out to help anybody. And he's, he's shutting you in. Yeah. This is, this is judgment. Yeah. And, and on that last day, see, that's, that's what I, I always picture this as the last day. Yeah. And there's going to be people who wish they would have listened because they, they ridiculed us. They poo-pawed us. Um, you know, because uh, the worst thing about not being in heaven is knowing you could have been because Jesus had paid the price. You know, that's, to me, that's the worst thing. All right, so, uh, yeah, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, how did they know months back then? February. Feb well, we don't, they weren't, that, that's coming a little later. But they kept track of moon cycles, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, so they, they had months and, you know, days, so that, that's not a problem. On the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, just like had been said. So I, what I want, the, it's kind of hard for me to envision. So. Yeah. Do you, do you remember pictures of like uh, oil wells when they're drilling and then they hit a gusher? What happens? And you got to cap that, 
you know, and uh, get it under control or you just did all that work for nothing. So, but I mean, you think of all this water, tremendous amount of water that was under pressure. And then when God breaks open the surface of the land, the water comes n not just bubbling up, bursting out. Yeah. And well, yes, and, and I mean, the, this is when continents are being divided. This is when mountains are being formed. You know, this is when all that rising and falling. Uh, by the way, highest mountain ranges, what did they find on, on those highest mountain ranges? Fossils of shellfish and fish. Wow, how could that be? You know, woo, must have been a worldwide flood somewhere, woo. You know, anyway. Um, so on that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind and livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Noah, then the Lord shut him in. So there we see God organized the animals. Um, he did it all. Um, and he's the one who shut the door. And he's doing that to protect his people. And he's doing that to seal the unrighteous out. You know, on that last day, it's too late. You know, about the time that when Jesus is visible coming back to earth, um, it's going to be too late to say, oh, wait a second. Oh, well, you mm -hmm. know because God's people have already been taken up to be with him. Um, so the Lord shut him in. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Now, can you imagine that? You know, it does. It explains an awful lot. And, and as we said last time, it, you know, there's eight different cultures, at least, that have stories of a worldwide flood. And eight people that survived on a boat. You know, ah, coincidence? I don't think so. Um, but it, it's hard to envision that, um, you know, all that water coming up, all that water coming down. Think of that whole canopy of water. Uh, where was it? Uh, I guess it was a place in China that got 18 inches of rain in, uh, in like five hours recently. And, it, and it, like at one hour, they got five inches of rain. You know, when, you know, and you think of the, the clouds that are associated with a hurricane, they're sucking up all that water from the oceans. And then, you know, we've gotten it dumped on us here and we're fortunate. It's usually dried out a little bit by the time it gets to us. but. Uh, you just think of how much water even those things can. But now we have this thick canopy that was filled with water. And now that water is all coming down and coming up. Uh, so, whew, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about. Um, let's see, verse 20. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. So the highest mountain was covered by 20 feet of water. <laughs> yeah, that's what the dinosaur said as the waters came. <gasps> yes. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. So 150 days, the waters 20 feet above the highest mountain. So it's not just 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights, the water you know, kept coming. And then 150 days, it's there. So all right, here's where I want you to think about. What happened to the bodies of all those animals that died and all the humans that died? 
Well, one, they're going to float around for a little while because when, when the water's in turmoil, bubbling and churning and massive currents, they'll get carried along some, but eventually they're going to end up on the bottom somewhere, right? Wouldn't some of the fish scavenge some of the bodies? Oh, yeah, there's some, some, but now what else is in the water besides all these dead things? Silt. Silt, because that, you know, you know what color the Catawba River is when, um, when we get a heavy rain. And it is not kind of a greenish color that it should be. What color is it? Orange yeah, orangish brown. It's not, not even brown, which is what rivers in Wisconsin after a heavy rain are brown. Here they're reddish whatever, you know. And, and then what the, the mouth of the Mississippi, what's true about the mouth of the Mississippi as it pours into the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, it, they're constantly adding to the land total. All this silt that's coming down the river gets, you know, that where the current stops, it's now in a bigger body of water, all that gets deposited, and they're constantly having to do what? Dredge to keep the shipping channels open. Um, by the way, I went to, uh, I directed our family. We were, we, were, we were trying to schedule stops on our way to Texas that would be fun. I love to go to beaches. I love to look at shells. And the Shell Beach is in, uh, I think that was in, no, yeah, it was in Louisiana. Shell Beach. And I thought, well, let's go to Shell Beach, Louisiana, and walk the beach and see if there's shells. Um, and we, we found Shell Beach. Our GPS took us right there. And there was a, a channel, a river, a um, couple channels and uh, type of thing. But we couldn't find any sandy beach. And so we stopped and said, uh, where's Shell Beach? He said, this is it. You know, where's, where's the sand? Well, there is no sand anymore. They recut the channel. And now there's no shells get, that come along here. Or, you know, that's not where shellfish live anymore. And there's no sand anymore. It's all change because it all keeps getting buried and you know but all that silt is there now I want you to think about animals are heavier than silt so you get a t-rex that's kind of floating in the water he's going to go down pretty fast because well brachiosaurus a hundred thousand pounds he's going to sink to the bottom pretty fast and then you've got all this soil that's going to still be going and bit by bit it starts settling down and settling down and settling down and settling down and settling down and, settling down. and pretty soon it's burying all the things that landed first which would be all those dead animals and and you know all those bodies and what does it take? So I, I printed a couple things. How do fossils form? Uh, fossils are formed in many ways, but most are formed when a living organism, such as a plant or animal, dies and is quickly buried by sediment, such as mud, sand, or volcanic ash. Yeah, and then what happens? You know, then it, it ends up being fossilized. It becomes, you know, kind of petrified wood. You can kind of think of what that is. That's that's what, you know, that's what happens. The um, the, the fossils that I brought in of the woolly mammoth, um, that's not exactly the same substance that it was before it was fossilized. It's, th now it's kind of like a rock that looks like, you know, something. But, um, so th I mean, th that's, that's how you explain it. Why do some things become fossils but others do not? It's very likely that any organism on Earth will either be eaten by scavengers or decomposed by microorganisms after it dies. That's what happens to just about everything. Uh, organisms de decompose more quickly when they're in contact with oxygen. Most environments exposed to the open air are in contact with plenty of oxygen, so the soft tissues of dead organisms, whether plants or animals, decay quickly. Many, if not most, underwater environments also have a lot of oxygen, since water can dissolve oxygen from the atmosphere. Uh, for an organism to become a fossil, it must not decompose or be eaten. This can happen if the organism either lives within or is moved to a place where it can be buried and kept from decaying. When an organism is buried quickly, there's less decay, and the better the chance for it to be preserved. And then it goes on and on. Yes? I got to go on a trip to Pompeii. And so there weren't the human remains, but they, when they were excavating, they would find air pockets. 
and they learned then to start pouring like plaster paris or whatever in those air pockets and it would form the individual oh interesting and they would find them in the position like they were in a corner and they had their hands over their mouths trying to but yeah. that was there were, weren't remains but they could even tell by like i think the slaves or servants wore a certain type belt that the the plaster of paris mold they made would show who was yeah a, a so servant. obviously that type of thick lava type stuff yeah yeah the ash would bury it too where and if you get three four feet of ash oxygen's not getting through that you know but um yeah, it's interesting. I once used a sermon illustration, so this is supposedly true, and I won't have all the details. But um, they, one of the remains they found was of a person who um, had been running away from the volcano, is what they speculate, but then dropped something and was found on the ground, like crawling back for a bag of jewels that she had dropped. And so she died going back for something that was absolutely worthless in the big scheme. Like, don't go back for it. Keep running, you know? But, oof, yeah. So, the, yeah, that's the perfect environment. The tar pit type thing, perfect environment. But so is rapid sedimentation when there's a worldwide flood and you got all that water carrying all that sediment. And it, when, when it stops raining and it stops coming up from the deep, then the sediment starts settling. And you're going to end up, you think of, um, how much water that was, there would have been not just feet of sediment, but a hundred or more feet of sediment that's covering everything. You know, as, and then as the water's going, it's going to kind of, you can kind of think of how it would push things together. So if there's a bunch of animals and there's a low spot that had died, they all get kind of pushed into that low spot from the currents and then sediment comes and settles and they're gonna that's why you find those mass graves it's not that everyone said oh i have to go here to die you know that's not it that's where currents put things but it, you you would not have all the wonderful fossils that exist without a worldwide flood quite honestly yeah. there's always a jumble of them it's not like just one particular no when you find one you find a bunch usually because that's where the water is pushing it down to and once it gets to that low area or you can kind of think of a river um, so a rivers cutting into a river bank on one side but on the other side it slows down as it goes and so things will settle so there's areas where naturally things settle and so those bodies would have ended up there and then the sediment's going to settle there faster too but are they finding like the same type of dinosaurs together or dinosaurs that probably wouldn't have lived together you know what i'm saying yes so it's not just like um you're going to find 10 t-rexes all in one place you might find you know and it's not just dinosaurs by the way there's a lot of other fossils in there too but you'll you'll find um 20 different types of dinosaurs all kind of in this same area I really doubt they all lived right in that little area and then, you know, and, but even if they did, they die, their bodies don't turn into fossils unless you've got the flood thing. All right, so just uh, let's talk. We're going to run out of time. So, um, so that we, we know there would have been two of every type of dinosaur on the ark. And after the flood, they would have been released and they would have gone and uh, had children and grandchildren. Clean. Well, they would be unclean, so there would have been two to start out with. But you can think of what happens with rabbits or certain other things. When you have two, you'll end up with plenty. Goats. Um, <laughs> I, we uh, toured a goat farm recently where, and bought some goat cheese, three different types of goat cheese. So that was kind of fun. But I learned all about goats, and there's two different types of goats. Ones have ears and ones don't, and I did not know that. So um, that are used for milking goats. There's more than two types of goats, but yeah, I, I know all about them. But goats, you know, if you, if you have four or five females and one male, you're gonna have 100 goats within, you know, a few years. Uh, it, won't, it won't be that hard. Um, but that's, you know, so, but then what happened? Because now 
We don't see dinosaurs or dragons or whatever we want, Leviathan or Behemoth. We don't see them anymore. So we know most of them died at the flood, but some would have lived on until what? So, yeah, now remember, the conditions of the world changed drastically after the flood. Before the flood, perfect temperature. Adam and Eve didn't get hot or cold. It was just that perfect, what would that be? To me, it would be 82 degrees or something like that. Warm, but not hot. And, you know, it gets down to 65 at night, which, you know, don't have to put on a coat. Yeah. You know, it's just that nice weather. You're just fine. But... Yeah, the, there, now we had all this change that happened to the environment, and it went from the extreme of this perfect temperature. Now um, there's this rapid ice age. And by the way, we know this happened how? How do we know that an ice age happened about, say, 5,000 years ago? Yeah, I mean, in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So Wisconsin's called, or Minnesota's called the land of 10,000 lakes. They actually have more than that. Um, um, and Wisconsin has more than 10,000 lakes. Now, North Carolina, how many natural lakes were there before they put dams up and created lakes? How many were in North Carolina? I don't know. That could be right. I'm not, but he, I was told by someone, and so I'm taking someone's word. I don't know this for a fact, um, that uh, there were none. Now, so why is Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan? Why are there all these lakes there? And then this isn't, you know, this is not thousands and thousands of miles away. How come? Where do the lakes kind of start fading out? Yeah, further south, and we got these Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. So, the, but there, during the Ice Age, the glaciers came down, and the glaciers, as they ebb forward, oh, you know, and that's kind of a neat process if you've seen a glacier, you know, that it edy is digging out, it's pushing rocks and dirt out, and it leaves, a, you know, it's a, the, what's left behind is a, a lower area where the glacier is. And when the glacier melts, it's a lake. You know, that's what it is. Um, but the glaciers didn't come to North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. Uh, they, I mean, this whole eastern seaboard, I think on this side of the Appalachian Mountains, they just didn't get the glaciers. And, and I would guess... I would, formed the Appalachian Mountains? I think so. I think it kind of shoved it up. You know, I think that's their forward edge. But I, this is my speculation. So you, if, you know, if you know different, please correct me, because this is kind of, I've not studied this in great detail. But I do know you got all these lakes. Um, why don't we here? We have to dam the rivers to create our lakes. And there are a lot bigger lakes, because Wisconsin, you don't need that big a body of water to be called a lake. You know, and that's part of why we have 10,000. But uh, um, so. You know, but that ice age that came, all those glaciers, animals that are cold-blooded, like reptiles, which are dinosaurs, um, are sluggish. They, they're, they don't function well. Um, you, the blue-tailed salamanders, where do you see them most times in the middle of the day? Under a rock. Uh, yeah, on a rock, somewhere sunning, where they're absorbing heat from the rock. Or the bricks, they're on a, you see them on the church all the time. Um, they see them on the bricks of my house all the time. But they're absorbing heat from the sun and the stored up heat. And the, you know, why do they need that? Because that helps their digestive system. It, it helps them to function at what they need. And when the temperatures are real cold, they're just going to hibernate and you know, hope to survive. Like a geese to migrate south. Well, those blue-tailed <laughs> salamanders don't migrate. Monarch butterflies, isn't it amazing how far they will, uh, the, the, you know, they will migrate. But yeah, I mean, dinosaurs aren't going to go a thousand miles. I mean, because it's already getting cold, they're, they're not going to have the energy for it. And by the way, if you come upon a village where there's people and you're sluggish, what are they going to do? They're going to kill you. 
and it would be easy to if you're hardly moving. And by the way, uh, Dragon was a, fed a village. You know, that's woolly mammoth. When they got killed up in uh, Alaska, man, that's good eating for a long time when you think about it, because that's what they do with whales. They're still allowed to hunt whales, and you know, that feeds a village for a long time, quite honestly. But if you have that biblical worldview of a worldwide flood, and, and the Ice Age is pretty well supported by everyone. I mean, what, what our evolutionary society likes to believe, though, is that the, um, the, the glaciers and the Ice Age had nothing to do with the flood. They say it was just um, climate change. Wow, you know. We needed more industrial engines burning oil in back then because then we could have prevented all that. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that uh, everything, all the changes in the past happened on their own, but now they're Melinda's fault because I saw her drive a car here. <gasps> and Jerry did too. Oh, I, oh, I did too. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be pointing fingers at you when I did it too. My but, car is a truck. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But so what, what I wanted you to see, you know, why did the animals die out? Easy to understand. Um, and why are there fossils? Easy to understand with a biblical worldview. Without it, you have, to, you have to keep speculating and speculating. You come out with almost crazy stories sometimes because they can't admit Bible. They can't admit worldwide flood. They can't admit anything. Right. You know, so what, what does uh, an, uh, a modern humanism evolutionist say about worldwide flood? Myth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Dragon's myth. You know, all it says is myth. And because they, they say that, they can't rely on that to explain things. And that's where they have to end up with millions of years and all this other stuff, you know. Do you but. think they were woolly mammoths so they aren't too? Um, yeah, now that's, so woolly mammoth is uh, related to an elephant. An elephant. Yeah. So, so I think, yeah, there would have been at least babies of, it may have just been two something between an elephant and a woolly mammoth that the genetic codes are in there. And then uh, through selective breeding, meaning, who they hang around with, and the, you know, then certain characteristics. But yeah, woolly mammoth was somehow on that arc, whether that's in the potential gene pool of an elephant. I kind of think of it the other way, that there would have been a couple baby woolly mammoths. So how long were people on the arc total before they got off? So we know for 150 days the water didn't go down, and then the water started going down, and so remember Noah started sending out a dove to see if the dove could find a place to land because he was hoping someday to get off. I have no doubt he would have liked to have got off that ark at some point. Yeah, I, and that's, I don't know if I even have it written down. Let's see. All right. Is there someone who Googles really well behind the, look up how long was Noah on the ark? Because I, I seem to think my answer was over a year, but I, I hate to go on my memory because yeah, it, it had to be because, you know, they... It said in the 600th year of... All right, go ahead, Abby. Oh, 370. 370 days. Yeah, so that's what I thought. Because I, I, I thought I remembered reading it was over a year. So, um, so what is... Because we know what year, how old Noah was when it started. So it, I guess I sh we didn't read all of it, but... It said in the 600th year of Noah's life on the 17th day of the second month. And then that's when it started springing up. And then uh, 8.13 says, by the first day of Noah's, the first month of Noah's 601st year. So, yeah, and see, that is, that five days over a year, that fits perfectly, you know. Um, so that, just interesting. But do you think they were glad to get off the ark? Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> now, at first, what, what would have the land been like that they're walking on? Because, I mean, the, the, the dove came back with what in its beak? It came back with the... Uh, uh, yeah, some sort of plant, living plant life. So that meant it had been um, 
you know, all the seeds were buried, so plants would start coming as soon as sunlight, you know, would start growing, but you're not going to get a lot of big things for a while, but, you know, that, that land had been exposed to sun and had the chance for things to start sprouting at least. Um, but the total, total amount of surface area they would have had to go around and probably was small at first. Um, I'm not sure they let all the animals out immediately because until there's lots of food out there, um, you know, but interesting to think about. I, I don't have all those answers. I needed to. They try to find the art, like where it is, where, where it is. Well, if, if all the trees and everything were, you seem they would use, I would assume they would use the materials they had on hand, which would be the art to rebuild anything. Uh, and because trees aren't going to be around for a long time. Yeah. yeah 814 says by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Yeah. So, so that that's an, that's another month more or less, and now that doesn't mean it's not muddy. It doesn't mean that everything's growing yet, but it's starting to at that point. Well, that's when God said to Noah, "Come out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature." So that's God gave it. them permission when yeah. it was safe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, isn't that interesting? Well, yeah, we aren't told about that, but that could have happened, too, because they didn't have TV on that cruise. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. 59 natural lakes in North Carolina. How many? 59. All right, see, thank you. I was totally wrong. But two in Virginia. Two in Virginia. All right. And I'm going to guess those 59 lakes are closer to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, because it's, uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. This area, that's where it's all man-made. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of what we have to say about dinosaurs. So I, I'm not planning on coming back here um, when we come back. So what do you think, because we're at time, what's a topic you would like? If you don't give me an answer, then that means whatever I come up with is what we're going to talk about. So what would intrigue you, make you for sure want to come? Some of the prophecies from the Old Testament that aren't some of the ones we met, uh, know readily that came true. Okay. Or that. And those might not, the ones we focus on are usually the ones about Jesus, you know, so, you know, with the specific prophecies about his birth and death and resurrection. We know those pretty well, um, but there's a lot of other things that happened. Um, very interesting. So that could be something that would be kind of interesting to do. All right, throw out another idea. Because I'm going to write these down when we're. Yeah. When, when you leave, I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> Anything else strikes you? So there's one thing I've always wanted to have a sermon preached on or a Bible study taught about. What's that one thing? Now, for those of you who have been at St. John's for a long time, I've preached on almost everything, of course, over... <laughs> <laughs> Whether you wanted me to or not, but no, I, there's still a lot of stuff that I've never done. There's whole books of the Bible I've never given a sermon on yet. Isn't that interesting? Because they're not part of the, the lectionary, the assigned reading. So I, we usually use the assigned readings, but there's a lot of other stuff. All right. Well, if you think of something, text me or call me and just tell me. If there's something that really you're fascinated about or a book of the Bible you've always wanted to study, just give me ideas. And, and then um, before September 1st, I'll, I'll be advertising what we're going to do for that time. But, Melinda, I'm not going to uh, minimize your suggestion. So that will be, we'll do that for sure somewhere. I, I don't think that would be a long-term study but it would be an interesting one to kind of do like we did with dinosaurs for a few weeks, just to look at how accurate God's prophecies are and, and then the historical, uh, where we see them being fulfilled. And most of the time, you can think of when Isaiah says this country is going to perish and there will never be another city on that site again. You know, that stuff we can document that it really happened. So, yeah, that would be interesting. All right, well, let's close in prayer. You can tell me any time if you've got other ideas. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word has so many answers, and mainly we don't look there, and mainly we don't listen. But help us to listen. 
Help us to believe and help us to share with the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, I'm writing that down.